see far Wait, one sec. One sec. Hello and welcome to South Fork Sea Farmers Fish Farming, Big Industry or Sustainable Protein for the Future. I'm journalist Alexandra Talti and I'm here with Donna Lanzetta, of Mana, CEO and founder of Mana Fish Farms and Greg Rivara, aquaculture specialist at Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, fish farming can conjure up a visual of large fish tanks or ocean pens crowded with fish and the clearing of mangrove forests to create ponds, similar to poultry factories that we've all seen. But it's actually been a concept developed as far back as 2500 BC with the Chinese putting carp in rice pad patties where they ate insects and weeds, fertilized the rice, and then were eaten at the end. As we're kind of seeing a return to sustainability in the concept of knowing where our food comes from, fish farming is once again being examined as the way to eat of the future. It's estimated that by 2030, two thirds of the fish we eat will be farmed. And right now, as we're looking, our wild fish stocks are overexploited. Um, Donna, do you want to share what kind of models of fish farms that exist right now and how maybe? this newer version of fish farm is different than what many of consumers think about, in America at least? Big question, but my pleasure. Um, certainly there's uh, many different types of farming of fish that take, take place today. Uh, we have fin fish, shellfish, seaweed, culture. Uh, we have culture on land and culture at sea. Uh, when we're on land, we have uh, recirculating systems, we have flow through systems. Uh, we have um, pond culture, and then uh, at sea, we have, there's marine aquaculture near the shore, and then open ocean aquaculture. So, And in terms of, now Greg, I know you've been, you know, working at Cornell in this field for a while. What are the kind of, you know, when consumers think of this kind of bad fish farming, what is that model that they're thinking of? And how are places like Mana Sea Farms or other kind of newer ones different than that? They're thinking of things like antibiotics, overcrowding, uh, escape of fish into the wild where they breed and could uh, dilute, dilute, dilute the genetic stocks. Uh, and the, that has happened. All that has happened in the past. But things have definitely cleaned up. And we're talking decades ago, not like yesterday. Uh, and I think when you do the math on it, is nine billion people close to now in the world? They will be. You said it a few minutes ago, capture fisheries is at its peak pretty much. It's unlikely it's gonna get any more. Uh, and we gotta get seafood from somewhere. It's a healthy protein. So the question is not, are we gonna be growing more seafood? Maybe 40, 50% of the seafood we eat is farm right now. Now you're saying two thirds in, in a decade or so. I believe that because aquaculture is by far three times, maybe more, the fastest growing segment of agriculture. Because in New York State and federal law, aquaculture is equated with agriculture. We can get the same, some most of the same services that dirt farmers get. So we have to farm more seafood. The question isn't, are we going to? The question is where? Mm -hmm. And are we gonna rely on folks like Donna and her company and US-based companies that do it right? Or pl places, I won't go, go into any, any countries, that really are doing it quick and literally dirty. Uh, I won't, again, mention any species or countries, but I, w I don't eat a lot of farm seafood that I see at places like Costco and uh, other stores uh, because of where it's come. Country of origin labeling is, is pretty critical, knowing where that fish comes from. You know, if it's Chile, Norway, or US, Canada, yes. Other countries, but not, not so much. That's interesting. And can you share a little bit about how, you know, I think, that's one thing I found in my reporting, something like 93% of American of seafood con consumed in America is imported. And then you kind of get in, you know, if you are buying American seafood, either farmed or caught, it represents some of the most sustainable practices in the industry. The problem is um, these like third parties are kind of buying it from another place 
and then it's imported in. Can you share a little bit more about that yeah, in terms of fish farming? Yeah, I'm not too up to speed on the marketing the, of, of seafood. I know that a lot of our products do go overseas to be cut because it's cheaper to send them to China, and then they're sent back here. They're exported back. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're caught here, and most are in the Pacific. So if you, you buy these, uh, the artificial crab meat, surimi, it's mm -hmm. basically pollock. It's a, it's a pretty big fishery, Alaska and uh, that, that part of, of our country. And it's pretty sustainable for a wild capture fishery, but a lot of it's processed overseas because we just can't afford to do it here. Mm -hmm. And they're really large ships that do that. Uh, totally different than you know, what you're looking at doing. And you mentioned this blockchain technology, which keeps track of things. And you really know where your, you know, your food's coming from, unlike this anonymous food that's in a lot of our markets. And food service, too. I mean, schools, hospitals, cafeterias are serving a lot of stuff that's, uh, I don't know where it comes from. I'll say tilapia. Well, uh, we have 60% of our 91% of imports, 60% are coming from China. Yeah. And of those 60%, only 2% are inspected. So we don't really know what we're getting. And then I think we need to look to the new technologies like blockchain that will um, you know, lock in the provenance of the seafood, you know, be able to track it through the supply chain, and even track the carbon footprint of the product, and track the temperature as it's um, through the chain and maintain the quality of the product, and then be able to layer in the story of the fisherman or the farmer and kind of promote U.S. seafood through uh, educating consumers that this is a U.S. product, it was farmed or it was wild, and this is how it was done, and no antibiotics were used, and we didn't uh, you know, taint the ocean or taint the environment in any way. So we want to be able to base our decisions going forward on scientific facts and in order to do so, we need to get a farm uh, permanent, in, I think, in the ocean, particularly as a potential because the United Nations has said we have the greatest untapped potential mm -hmm. in the world, in the U.S., in our exclusive economic zone. And if you think about that, that's the area that surrounds our country that belongs to the U.S. that we could farm in. And we could use an area of one-tenth of one percent of the EEZ and be able to farm an amount equal to the total wild catch for the year. One-tenth of one percent could grow that much fish and really help uh, supply and re create jobs, uh, rejuvenate our aquaculture industry, and uh, really build seafood production for the U.S. Yeah, I think we have the most, what, we have the most coast in that easy zone yeah. in the world. And so no what a huge resource. Right. No farms out there, it's but if you, yeah. if you go around the world, you'll see that uh, their uh, federal waters, uh, exclusive economic zones around other countries, are being used to farm seafood in sustainable ways. If you look at companies like Open Blue in Panama, or um, actually in the United States, we have two very successful state water farms, uh, Net Pen Culture in Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, Forever Oceans or Blue Ocean Mariculture. They've been very successful, and these have uh, built up in the last five years. So um, as time has moved along and technology has developed to uh, allow sustainable production in the ocean. And what kind of fish farm would that look like if it were in this um, the zone off the coast of the U.S.? So right now, Mana Fish Farms is waiting uh, for permits uh, in Florida, and we have a permit pending in New York for a um, net pen culture uh, in Florida. We're 23 miles offshore. And we would use uh, submersible net pens. So they drop down underneath the water. And by submerging the net pens, we keep them safe from storms. Uh, we minimize the likelihood of uh, damage uh, from the elements. And also you can um, manipulate the temperature, you know, follow the sweet spot for the fish in the temperature column and be able to, in the water column, and be able to maximize uh, the happiness of the fish and the growth and for husbandry purposes. And if you have uh, sea lice that are technically mm -hmm. usually closer to the surface, uh, you drop down below them for that purpose. And uh, this is just the future. 
a couple things that just came to mind going back to your original question, issues. One is fish meal. You've mm. got to feed these fish. So unlike shellfish that filter natural phytoplankton, we don't really feed them except in the hatchery. Uh, we've got to feed these fish, pellets, right, pelletized diet. And in the past, a lot of the protein use was from smaller fish like anchovies, et cetera. And people would complain, well, why are we taking little fish and feeding them to big fish? And it, it was, it's, it, it, one of the corollaries was, it would be like growing cows and then feeding the cows to tigers and then we're eating the tigers. Because they're carnivorous. These salmon, mm -hmm. all these fish, not all of them, most of these fish, salmon especially, are carnivorous. They want to eat fish. They don't want to eat, they're not rabbits. They're not cows. There's a big difference, obviously. Uh, first of all, they're not warm-blooded fish. Second of all, they don't have gravity. They don't have to hold their body up on land like tigers do, like land animals do. They've got, they're weightless in the water. Cold-blooded, they don't need to expend energy to keep the body temperature up like we do. Hmm. So the efficiency is more like poultry. Uh, it, it's much more efficient than beef cattle, for sure, et cetera. Uh, and we're getting away from these uh, marine-based proteins. At the show, we just came back from San Diego a few weeks ago. It's a great place to be in uh, late February, early March. At Aquaculture America, uh, and it had to be 1,000 people there with over 800 presentations. Obviously, it was four days, so they were uh, concurrent sessions. But there was a trade show, and I've been going through these for a number of years, and there are folks there from the Soybean Council mm. giving out swag. Like, what's the soybean people doing here? Because they're making fish feed from soy proteins now. It's cheaper, and it's almost as good as fish. So most of these diets still include some fish, but they've gotten rid of a lot of it. So that's another thing mm -hmm. that's kind of off the table in terms of complaints, basically. And when you say, like, the efficiency, uh, it's closer to poultry than um, beef, if you could explain and pork. that the, a little The bit. number of pounds. Well, I think it's important to what Greg is saying is exactly correct, right? We have new ingredients now that they're using in fish feed production, whether it's... Uh, crickets or uh, algae or uh, even know, poultry poultry even, yeah. uh, waste from chickens soy plant-based uh, yeast uh, so that's all very interesting but going back to you know protein production and here we are having to produce protein in the face of climate change which is the greatest challenge of our lifetime right and you have to look at how to be most efficient so if we take a pound of feed and feed it to a pound of fish uh, feed it to fish, we get a pound of fish. So it's a very efficient protein uh, feed to protein, feed conversion ratio. But when you feed chicken, it's less efficient. So you might get three or up to five pounds of feed uh, for a pound of chicken. I don't know exactly. Yeah, and then up in beef area, you could go seven to nine pounds mm. of feed to get a pound of beef. And, and the water use too, of course. Of course. In livestock. Is there's nothing really generally right. involved. There's a little bit in feed production, but not with the fish are in water. Right. So you're not, you don't need fresh water for <clears throat> fish farming. So it's about balance. It's about balancing production, uh, whatever type of production, uh, with the environment and with you know, the climate. If you're farming in a recirculating system, of course you have more energy use. So mm -hmm. that's that. But but we need it all. We need shellfish. We need seaweed. We need finfish. We need it on land. We need it at sea. We need it all. We have to feed the world. Another complaint is you're going to put the wild capture, the fishermen with these trawls out of Montauk and Shinnecock and Bayman out of business because you're going to grow so cheap that they're not going to be able to keep up. That's What's not true. <laughs> well, so, um, you know, because they're assuming that we're going to bring all of our product in at the same time and drop the price down to, to nothing. Like well, a lot of the mm -hmm. commercial That's guys almost, have to do because they can't store it, yeah. But mm -hmm. we have the option because our fish are growing in a net pen underwater. We don't have to bring it in all at the same time and it's not our plan or offshore farmers don't bring it all in at, together for that very reason. So the price doesn't get depressed. What we can do is work to build year round supplies for certain mm -hmm. species that where they don't exist and in fact maybe create new markets for underutilized species that might be cultured. But uh, we can we would bring them in and store you know, they stay stored underwater in our in our pots so we can bring them in regularly. We wouldn't want to deflate the price because that would hurt us. It just doesn't make sense, but it's uh, certainly commonly uh, thrown up 
as a negative, a potential negative for farming. And what are the other, what are the species difference between kind of what you'd be able to farm in New York or Florida versus wild caught? Well, so we look to, like in Florida, for example, um, we captured our brood stock from the area within 60 miles of our offshore proposed farm. So we bring those brood stock then into the hatchery. Um, they're wild. There's mm. no hybrids. That's another argument. Oh, frankenfish, they're all genetically modified. Not only are they wild, uh, matched to the area, they're also sterilized. Mm -hmm. So they don't uh, breed in the wild if one should get away. So really, uh, it's a stock enhancement if we were to drop one. But there's also new technology that helps to minimize any of those risks right now of escapes and um, any type of uh, integration of our cultured fish with the wild. And what they've shown scientifically is if one did get out, it's not likely to survive. Perhaps you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, the fish are grown in hatcheries. <laughs> they're not really meant for the wild. They're fed up, prepared diet pretty much from birth. So they're not used to hunting and they don't do well. And it's been shown in, in salmon, uh, salmon farm escapes in Maine and Atlantic Canada. I'm not sure about Europe. So it's not really a big deal. And I'll add to that by saying another thing, negative <coughs> is disease. You're bringing diseases in. Sea lice you mentioned earlier. Keep in mind, the same thing goes with shellfish. No farm species ever created a disease from nothing. Mm. They get a disease from nature. It's the, already in the water. Now, maybe it's exacerbated because they're, they're tightly kept in, in a pen. They have to be because you can't have a couple of fish swimming around in a pen the size of this room. It wouldn't be uh, you know, affordable. It wouldn't be reasonable. So they, they can get diseases, but they're not creating them out of, out of thin air or from the hatchery generally. So just I'd say keep that in mind as well. And so in terms of the, the restaurants, and you know, I think you have such an interesting business model. And as more and more consumers are interested in food transparency, I think this kind of restaurant connected to a farm whether that's a land farm or a water farm, you know, I think that's uh, something that we're going to see a lot more of. Um, and especially in a place like Eastern Long Island, where we do have access to so many great foods, um, you know, it's already so natural to happen. If you could kind of talk through like what the journey that one of these fish would take to the plate, I think that could be interesting. Well, so yes, thank you. It, it's been interesting to integrate the restaurant Mana Lobster Inn into the plan for aquaculture. And it's been a natural fit really because um, the restaurant serves as a platform to explain why this is so important, what is sustainable seafood production, how, what does it look like, and what does it taste, and what better learn, way to learn than to taste the fish. But, what we've done now is added another layer on top with the uh, Mana Seafood Blockchain, mm -hmm. which will actually track the products from the dock through the, through the supply chain and then into the restaurant. And all of that information will be gathered on QR codes and consumers uh, in the restaurant or the market who want to know more about the product can actually scan in and get a little video clip of the fisherman and the farmer who caught that uh, or harvested that product, see how long it was in the hatchery or where they caught it offshore if they want to let their spot go. And that's the beauty of the blockchain. You don't have to let all the information out. You can mm -hmm. choose what you want to share. So we'll share that we brought it over the dock in Montauk, but we're not going to tell you exactly where it was caught because we don't want to give up our good spot <laughs> but um, so then it travels through and you can see for example there was a piece uh, a tuna caught in Montauk that was bought by a broker shipped to Japan auctioned off at the market ended up in Fulton at the market there was purchased by a restaurant that then brought it back to Sable Long Island so that fish traveled around the world if you talk about inefficiencies this is an opportunity to uh, show the supply chain and be able to uh, build efficiencies in the whole entire system. And do you hope that, you know, between customers at your restaurant and kind of promoting this concept, that more people will understand that kind of journey that fish might be taking to their plates now? 
I hope so. We're going to put the little QR codes into our menu. So as you sit there, because it comes up a lot with the oysters, so we carry about eight mm -hmm. different types of oysters, right? So you kind of want to know now, uh, what's the merwa of the mm -hmm. oyster? Where is it from exactly? Which bay? And sometimes, you know, the Shinnecock Bay oysters versus the Peconic Bay oysters. It's, it's exciting to have those discussions and talk about what's saltier, what's brinier. Mm. Um, so that, that will be able to uh, showcase that through blockchain. And can you speak a little bit, Greg, about why raising species lower on the food chain is a more uh, sustainable model for aquaculture and how that kind of relates to feed? Yeah, it's more sustainable because uh, you're using less of it. Like tilapia can't eat literally, you know, rabbit food. Mm. They're, they're, they're vegetarians. Would I rather have a salmon or a tilapia? I'd rather have a salmon. Uh, why don't I just eat the anchovies instead of growing? Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I like anchovies on pizza, but I don't want to eat like a, just, you know, like a whole bunch of them, like a pound of them on a plate. So that's the thing. It's, it's, is it a moral issue? Maybe it is. People are vegan. They don't think any of this should happen. The chickens, the cows, the fish. Uh, I like eating high quality proteins. Like, and I, my, I had an argument with my mom years ago. I don't eat farm salmon. What, what were you watching? What did you read? Well, it has dyes in it. Well, yeah, it has naturally. It, they have to dye the feed to make the, the flesh pink, reddish. But it's basically paprika. It's, it's a natural, mm -hmm. and I hate to say dye, but it's a natural colorant. Uh, and it's true. But it's nothing wrong with it. And if you look at the risk profile, I'm not going to buy farm salmon. I can't afford wild salmon, or it's not available year round. So I'm not going to get salmon. I'm going to get steak instead. It's really cheap at the A and P, <laughs> whatever. I should, that's Costco. dating. That's dating. With <laughs> a &P. Uh, what's that doing to your cholesterol, mom, et cetera? So maybe you should eat the farm salmon because it's been shown it's not. There's, there's not issues with the dye is not going to give you cancer, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's, to me, it's a risk factor thing. And I think eating high quality protein, as long as it's farmed responsibly, is, is a good thing. Uh, lower on the food chain is great. I've been, do, I'm more into uh, shellfish. I grew trout and tilapia on Long Island back in the late eighties in a greenhouse oh, cool. with aquaponics. I, yeah. I, I hooked up with this hy a hydroponics guy in Kutchog. We became good friends and he was selling uh, trout to star bogs in West Hampton, for instance. Uh, he sold lettuce at a green market in in the city, a dollar mm. a head. This is in like the early 90s. And he couldn't call it organic, so he had a, a sign he made on his dot matrix printer. This is how long ago this is. Mm. Uh, lettuce with no sides, like pesticides, fungicides. And he was selling for a buck a head, and these things grew within a couple of weeks. He had a nice Boston bib, had a lettuce. The fish became pets to him, and they provided the fertilizer in the system that we built through vermiculite and perlite beds in his greenhouse mm. to feed the plants. So again, and I'd rather have a trout than a tilapia, but uh, we grew the trout in the winter and tilapia in the summer because it's those are the temperatures. But you know, you're in the ocean; it's uh, it's a different environment altogether. And yeah, I've been totally inspired by our COO Mike Meeker, who farms up in Canada, and he's the first organic rainbow trout farmer in North oh, wow. America because the Canadians have organic standards for seafood. So yeah, we um, don't. It should be said we don't have that yet. We don't have it yet. However, <laughs> the Mauna Ocean Foundation is has begun a program to certify U.S. seafood organic to the Canadian organic standards. Mm. So oh, we're wow. just launching that now. Um, very excited about that. And it was based on what I learned working with Mike. And so uh, Mike set up the or helped to establish these organic standards in Canada. And things that go into that, it means you can't overstock your net pens. It's 15 grams per cubic meter is the stocking density according to the organic standards. You can't use or, or, uh, antibiotics. You're not mm -hmm. using any genetically modified uh, products in your feed. You have to buy an organic feed, which is all natural and no chemicals. And it's a beautiful thing. And I think that that's where we need to go uh, in the US. And this is actually one of those areas, because I know with like organic labeling with meats and stuff, there's actually not that much, the USDA has really blocked the ability for farmers who are using more sustainable practices to label themselves organic because of the pressure of the big meat purveyors. Um, 
And so the only, I think only poultry is like an organic designation in terms of like what it's fed and stuff. Mm -hmm. And even then it, there's not many rules that the farmers have to obey, which many of these people are very keen on doing that because they're like you already doing the sustainability thing. So they kind of want the credit for it in a way with the consumer. So I feel like there's a big opportunity in the fish world where, you know, you don't necessarily have that pushback yet. Right. And that's, kind of how I got into blockchain because I started speaking with farmers in the U.S. and saying, hey, why don't you become the first mm -hmm. organic farmer, like a Hudson Valley farm in um, Hudson, New York, that's farming, they're farming steelhead. And uh, they would say to me, why would I do that when someone's going to switch out my product in the marketplace? Because, mm -hmm. you know, 46% of all seafood is mislabeled. So um, to lock it in onto the blockchain so it doesn't get switched out would protect that brand identity and value and uh, you know, also incentivize uh, good behavior. <laughs> and um, so what kind of fish are you farming then? So our plans to farm in Florida are to farm red drum. And here in New York on our species list, we have um, steelhead trout, uh, striped bass, or it looks like it's going to be black sea bass, uh, moving up into position number one. Uh, we're, um, you know, looking to do oysters and seaweeds and other shellfish that we're excited about. Um, and then, as I said, between the restaurant and the blockchain and the organic program, I think we're going to be pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And with the blockchain, are you imagining that to be for like New York or would that be for any kind of seafood farm that would want that accountability? Any seafood farmed and wild that would want to uh, come onto the blockchain, we would do that. It's a global operation, potentially. <laughs> That's very exciting. I, I feel like, you know, as more people are talking about food transparency, there's a, there've been some skits about it, you know, where people like want to meet their chicken before, <laughs> which is funny, but it is true, especially when we know, you know, the kind of things that can happen behind the curtain, especially in the U.S. Yeah, I'm thinking of Portlandia. Yes, the that's restaurant. the skit, and they go and the visit the farm. Chicken's name is Fred, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I want to know the chicken's name. Like no, I don't, don't need name, a photo. Don't name animals is the first order yeah. of business. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you advise, you know, you've mentioned a few different kind of places that you would believe it, a fish would be ethically sourced from. What would other tips do you have for a consumer, you know, farm salmon you're saying is good if it's from the U.S.? You gotta, it's very hard to find salmon from U.S. I just had wild salmon actually recently too when you can, when you can find it. Okay, uh, so you say wild salmon, what are the seasons for that? I'm not even sure, honestly. Okay. Maybe somebody in the audience knows more than I do <laughs> about it. I had uh, something from uh, from the West Coast. It was a coho. A friend brought it, actually. Mm. He was in Alaska last week. It was really good. It was smoked salmon, actually. Uh, it was 46% chance it was mislabeled. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping not because it was a small place, but yes, it, it could have been. And there's, you can do these genetic tests, and it's been shown. It's wow. really easy. And my uh, one of my uh, North Fork uh, markets I go to, the owner I know pretty well has a bumper sticker, tilapia, that's not seafood, on the back of his truck. And he goes to the dump of his truck, it's like, you know, the, and he has a lot of styrofoam because stuff comes in, in from the airport or whatever. And I go in his shop, this is years ago, and I go in his shop and he's got tilapia. Yeah. Uh, I thought you said it wasn't seafood. I sell so much of this stuff, it's amazing because it's cheap. Yeah. And it's a, a number of retirees, some elderly folks that are on a budget, and they buy this stuff. It's one of the cheapest fishes around, but you know it's... Well, that's is. the imported, but if you actually look now, there's some new farmers that have come up and started to farm tilapia in sustainable ways. They have to overcome that negative yeah. perception of tilapia as a farmed foreign fish, uh, unsustainably farmed foreign yeah. fish. But um, the reason they farm it is it's just so resilient. You could grow it in mud, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and is tilapia, that's usually the kind of fish you'd find in these closed loop hydroponic could be pond Systems. culture too, but yeah, closed loop things. Um. Well, they're doing striped bass now in Brooklyn. Really? In um, someone's doing barramundi over in Connecticut uh, wow. company. So I think we're going to see um, a diversity of species coming onto the marketplace and some exciting uh, new options for the future. And can one of you guys talk, I think we've mentioned closed loop system, but I don't know, 
you know, it's very cool if you've ever seen one of these. Mm. Um, I think it's kind of what people think of as a fish farm. But if you guys want to explain a little bit about that. It's basically uh, a building. Think of like a, a big warehouse, like a Walmart or Costco. It could be that big with tanks and pumps and plumbing. And it's basically uh, a sewage treatment plant in there. So the water gets recirculated. You're not doing, going once through. It's not going out the door. And the only uh, makeup water is lost due to evaporation from the tanks. And also there are some solids obviously formed. And you dewater those as much as possible. And those solids are removed. And if it's a fresh water system, they can be land applied pretty easily. Salt water system is a little trickier putting those on uh, like golf course or something because you don't want to salinize the plants and the groundwater. Uh, they're expensive. Uh, a professor at Cornell who is, I think, still teaching a course at the university about recirculating systems. He's an, uh, basically an ag engineer. The book is like that thick. I have it in my office. Uh, he started a farm up in Groton, New York, which is near the Cornell campus in Ithaca, and it went out of business within five years. And he, I know he got a mortgage on his house for the thing. And I felt bad for him, but it was just the, the economics in a cold place like that with, with spray foam insulation, I went to it. And you've got to keep the water in the 80s, you know, Fahrenheit for these mm. things to grow. And then you've got to truck food. It was, it was one place in the middle of nowhere. They were trying to get a more of a co-op where they need more of these. This is, again, at least 15 years ago, uh, where there'd be more than one place. They could cooperatively buy feed. They could cooperatively market and processing. Because mm -hmm. Americans don't want to eat a fish with a head on it. I don't want I want a filet. I, I, I don't want any scales, <laughs> nothing. Obviously, there are certain ethnic groups that want a whole fish. And that's why the market is. The live tilapia is worth a lot more than a dead one. But mm -hmm. then how do you go from upstate New York to, like, Philadelphia and New York, Boston? It's, it's, a, it's a tough sell, literally. That's why this, this Hudson thing makes more sense. Brooklyn and Connecticut, coastal Connecticut, makes more sense. It's close to the markets. Mm -hmm. And the price of fuel now to go places is <laughs> it's crazy. So. so, and usually these closed loop systems are also growing lettuce. Or not, no, not necessarily. It, it adds uh, a whole, a whole problem because you can't, you you don't want to treat, you can't treat the plants with something that'll kill the fish, yes. basically, mm -hmm. and that's an issue. So it's like having two farms in one, and most uh, there was one up uh, up in that I, I visited in Western Massachusetts a long time ago called Bio Shelters, really cool, and it, it was aquaponics where they've mm -hmm. linked the two. And he, they gave up, they, they just do fish now mm. because it's, it was just too complicated. And the fish is where the money is, you know, over time. Mm. Yeah, I visited two as well. And it's really, it seems such a cool system, but very difficult. Although I do agree in urban areas, you can kind of see the merit of that you can grow this lettuce or this mm. fish and then the market is right yeah. there. It, it's a really great teaching tool. In the Bronx, one of my colleagues at Cornell Extension, Philson Warner, uh, works with students, uh, youth at risk, et cetera, doing this in a classroom, taking like uh, PVC gutters you get at Home Depot and putting the plants in there and using that like a thin film <clears throat> and running with a little submersible pump, again, all cheap stuff off the shelf, 55-gallon uh, drums with fish in it, that kind of thing. So it's a really great teaching tool in high schools, even colleges. And actually, I know some jails, some prisons are using it for inmate uh, to teach them how to grow, grow things. Oh, wow, that's so yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. And can you, you know, again, I feel like this restaurant model that you have is so interesting and definitely the way of the future. What are the, what have the differences been, you know, with regulation and kind of setting up a business in Florida versus New York? And do you think that this concept is scalable in other states as well? I do. I think it's scalable. Um, it's been a challenge um, in New York and in Florida uh, for offshore permitting. Uh, however, you know, restaurants are everywhere, and that's really um, not a challenge. We can handle that. The particular um, Lobster Inn site was a little bit of a challenge because of its state of disrepair and mm -hmm. also, um, you know, the fact that it's such an expensive piece of property, really, to um, and, and to want to have seafood be affordable for the community and bring it in at a price that... Uh, you know, and have high quality. So it's just about balance again. Yeah. And our plans there are to build a recirculating system on the land across the street from the restaurant. Mm. So uh, really it could be a destination where you go and tour the farm, see a little bit about culture, whether it's kelp spools being seeded or uh, fingerlings being grown or shrimp perhaps. 
Um, and then uh, after you tour, you could go into the restaurant and sit down there. So. I yeah. love that. And I can vouch for the, the Lobster Inn because I went there. <laughs> I went to Southern College back in late oh, 70s okay. <laughs> with my parents and went there. And it would skip owned it. And it was a great place. And I went there more recently. Then it went more abundant. And I, I toured it with you and my wife years ago. And it was like, oh, my God, the floors were all buckled because it hadn't been heated. It was a disaster, and we went like Thank months you. ago, and it's like, wow, what a, what a difference. I love job. that location. It's so beautiful. It was a challenge, and I never really planned to have a restaurant in my business plan, but it mm -hmm. evolved this way, mostly because I was looking for a hatchery space. And uh, Jay Schneiderman, the town supervisor, called me and said, Donna, are you still looking for somewhere to grow your baby fish? Mm. I said, yeah. He said, well, meet me over at Lobster Inn. And when I met him there, he said, you know, they're going to build a 26-unit townhouse development here, and we're going to lose this wonderful property from the community. But if you buy the restaurant, the town will buy the marina. You buy the land across the street, and the town will buy the development rights. And mm. it was the first time the Community Preservation Fund was used for aquaculture. Um, so that was a beautiful thing. I, and uh, they also preserved a couple of acres outright. And uh, I think it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to... Now the town's going to build a marina there, and we're yeah. going to have slips for the community, and it's going to be great. We're working on it. Phase one is done. You know, going back to the holdup, though, it's federal permits is a big deal. What, what is the issue? I mean, other countries do this. They, they really care, and they, they, they want to produce in-house protein, and we're happy to get our stuff from China, apparently. Well, What's you know, the story? Why it's, is it? it's environmental protections, right, mm -hmm. and getting everybody on the same page as to – what the monitoring should look like, but how we're going to protect. miles offshore? Yeah, I mean, come but it's on. the same thing. It's not thing. like it's in the creek over here. But it's still. Like, it's, a, it's a drop in the ocean, literally. We've committed to 100% transparency. Uh, we're on weekly calls with 37 federal and state agencies oh now. Um, and our permits are just at a, you know, the application's gone in and come out, go in and come out. It's finally in the final form for Florida. And uh, we're still working in New York to get it into final form. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it's a process and the problem, I think the greatest challenge is collaboration because all of those agencies need to get on the same page as to uh, what they want to see, you know, what they want us to test. We had to survey 1,400 acres of seafloor surveyed oh in Florida. And when we sur surveyed it all, and that means taking a sample every 100 feet throughout the grid, looking for anything of archaeological significance, any type of habitat, hard bottom, we found a big strip of hard bottom right through the middle of the farm, so of the surveyed area. So we had to move a thousand meters, according to the EPA, mm -hmm. you have to be a thousand meters away from any hard bottom. Mm -hmm. So we went and surveyed another 700 acres, and then we were able to find a spot that is acceptable to everyone, and that's where we're planning uh, 12 net pens for Florida now. The net pens are, you know, 9,000 cubic, oh, let's see, each one holds like 2 million gallons of wow. water, 360,000 pounds of fish per net pen. And you're using like drone monitoring? Or? So we're setting all that up now. Um, what they're doing is uh, what's called deposition modeling to determine um, when we feed our fish, where is the, the feed going to fall that they do not eat? Mm -hmm. uh, when they uh, have waste, where is that waste going to fall? Because we can look at the currents and see. And then we know where we should put our sensors. So we know we're, mo we're sensing in the correct location. So I think, again, that goes back to how the technology has evolved over the last 20 years to allow us to do it in a way that is sustainable, mm -hmm. that is in the balance with the environment, that we can show at the end, we expect to show that we have a minimal impact on the environment and we can produce this wonderful uh, protein. And I know, you know, with kelp farming as well, the big kind of way that the carbon is going to be taken down is also in this um, this zone. But it's similar to you where, you know, the scientists want to do it, the business people want to do it, but because it's so new and we haven't really had technology to do it or even understood how we could do it until very recently, there's just a ton of regulation. And that's the, why it's such a slow pace, I think. And do you think that, you know, obviously you've been working on this for a while now, do you think if... I started a, a farmed fish company, it would maybe be easier today? Or do you think we're still looking at like the next 10 years, everyone is still, you know, getting on board federally as well as state 
wise? I mean, I think with climate change and just this renewed interest in our environment, which is wonderful, that it's going to take time for anyone. Mm -hmm. However, we have legislation pending in the United States uh, called the Aqua Act, which stands for Advancing the Quality and Understanding of U.S. Aquaculture. And um, that legislation, which is bipartisan in the House and Sen you know, House and Senate, we hope that that will get passed. That will help future applicants um, with a more streamlined, uh, clearer path going forward. Um, so things like that, I think, uh, eventually it won't be an eight-year process. Mm. Well, I have to say kudos because I think a lot of companies would have went somewhere else, Panama, Chile. It would have went to another have. country because it's ridiculous waiting a decade to get permits. As I traveled around the world to visit the other farms, it was these farms were run by U.S. citizens, yeah. and really? they were very, uh, you know, open arms to me to say, "Let me show. Oh, you're going to try to. You're doing it in the U.S. Kudos. Good yeah, luck good to luck, you. Yeah. And the, let me show you what we're doing here in Panama. Let me show you what we're doing here in Mexico. And what are the agencies that you're having? So the EPA, Army FDA, Corps. Army Corps. Oh wow. Um, gosh. All of them. All of them. Everyone. <laughs> There's 37. A Coast Guard, you know, you don't think about that. Mm -hmm. But we're actually in a military zone down. Mm -hmm. We had to get special permission mm -hmm. down in Florida because our, most of the Gulf is in a mil military zone. But um, so, yeah. And what are your guys' favorite kinds of farmed fish? I'm a big striped bass fan. Um, and there's a company, Pacifico, uh, in Mexico farming striped bass in a wonderful way. If you haven't uh, tried their farm, now this is a straight a straight bass Wild, or a hybrid. Straight. It's not a, a hybrid striped bass in freshwater. Okay. Freshwater. Yeah. So most of the farmed striped bass is a hybrid, which is a cross between a white bass and a striped bass. Um, but Pacifico, and when we, if we ever do farm striped bass, we would do the pure wild, not a, not a hybrid. And what is the kind of what are the fears or stereotypes around the hybrid ones? Well, they're modified, right? So they're genetically modified. So again, you then get into that, well, what if one gets out and even though it's sterile, somehow breeds with uh, a wild fish? Then are you going to yeah, have I, a I just want to say they're not genetically modified because they don't have any genes from to, to, to fish are the two fish, you know what I mean? They didn't bring a tomato gene in. Right. I just want to make sure that's clear. Okay, sorry. It, it's a hybrid. <laughs> We've been doing it for a you know, hundreds of years, and we should say that we're so far behind the terrestrial agriculture folks mm. with chick. You know, look at broiler chickens. Mm. In the 1950s, it took like you know months to get them that big. Now you get these gigantic things in weeks because it, the technology is there. Uh, and we're so far behind with a lot of a lot of things, including the genetics. Right. Without going into GMO, like we know right. the aqua bounty, salmon is one. Right. Make faster growing salmon, they did take a gene from another organism, put it in there. Uh, but did you see the selectively bred mussels that they're doing up no. in Maine? Uh, golden mussels. Oh, wow. Are so the shells gold? Or? Shells, shells are yeah, gold. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah, no. yeah. And, and oh, can you guys just explain quickly for someone who's just tuning in, like what the difference is between a selectively bred and genetically modified. Well, GMO is you, you're bringing in an, uh, a foreign gene from a different organism. So striped bass, in other words, the, the two basses are, are fish. You're, you're mating them. They're close enough that you, they can mate without anything. You can do it. You're not bringing in uh, a, a, a gene from a flounder to make them more resistant. Uh, a winter flounder that has antipeptides in their blood so they don't freeze in the winter. That's why they're called winter flounder. They're here in the winter. They have an antifreeze in their blood. We want to be able to grow you know, hybrid striped bass in a colder climate. That's GMO. Uh, triploid is something that's done a lot. A lot of things we eat are triploid. Anything that's seedless is generally triploid. Bananas, some watermelon. And there are a lot of triploid oysters around because in the summertime when they spawn, you get a water bag as an oyster. So I'm paying three bucks for this. <laughs> So uh, it started mainly, it started actually in Maine, uh, a, a colleague of mine invented this idea to create an oyster with three sets of chromosomes. And that's still not GMO because there's nothing else but oyster, oyster genes in there, but there's three sets. So they're sterile, functionally sterile for the most part. And they're more expensive to grow. We won't go into how they're grown. Uh, they're, my wife was doing it actually in her hatchery, doesn't do it anymore. Folks that are, are doing it on Long Island, uh, a couple farms, they'll buy some triploids, they're more money. They'll use those for summer harvest, and they'll do mostly diploids and normal. Like we all have, we're all diploids. Mm -hmm. We have two sets of chromosomes. And they'll sell those other times of the year. 
but they're getting them from generally from Maine, and that's old eagle getting them from a hatchery in Maine. That does a lot of uh, triploid work, so that's a difference. Selectively breeding goes back to like Gregor Mendel and you know whatever. And that's hundreds of years ago. Yeah, basically choosing like this fish is fast, the fastest and growing, this one is right, the pretty smart. colors. A dog, I want a dog that can go after rats. This dog is amazing. Let's yeah. breed that one with a smaller one because I want to go into the rat hole further. Which that's basically what we've been doing since agriculture was yeah. invented. Right. It's just we're, 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 we're like literally a century behind or decades behind In those fish. other industries. Yeah. And um, I want to make sure we have enough time for questions from the audience. So. Can you give a visual, uh, some sort of analogy for how big one of those ten, uh, the, the net um, out in the ocean would be, the you know, size of a football field or the size of uh, you know, what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the size, size of, of uh, one and a half football fields. They're spherical? Are they spherical or um, not? So these think. are hexagons, the ones that oh, we're using. Um, the aquapod that we originally planned to use, that technology was purchased by another company and the and retired, so it's no longer available. Mm -hmm. So we're using, we plan to use the storm safe submersible net pen, which is an octagon or a hexagon shape. And each one holds uh, 360,000 pounds of fish at the time of harvest. It could hold up to 500,000, oh but we're God. stocking uh, at 15 grams per cubic meter. And how many of these are you testing? So down in Florida, we're looking for 12. Another audience Super question. Donna, actually. Hi. Uh, at 15 grams per square meter, that's initial or final? Per cubic meter. Hi. Sorry, cubic um, meter. That's initial. throughout. We never exceed that stocking okay, densi so density. Yeah. Uh, and the hard bottom, can you explain the significance mm -hmm. of the hard bottom you had to move off of in Florida? Sure. Um, where we search, you know, siting is the most important thing really for the uh, farm when you have to select the proper site. And one of the things we look for is a sandy bottom uh, where we can moor. And um, we want to be away from any life, any habitat. So where there's a hard bottom, there could be coral and other life there. So uh, we move a thousand meters away from anything like that. How far offshore here? The um, site would you do, and and what about boats? What about them? Well, I mean, wouldn't they object to uh, crashing into these things or something? Well, so um, the site we're looking at here is about nine miles offshore out of Shinnecock. Um, we get placed onto the navigational charts and marked. Um, what we see from the state farm uh, out in Hawaii is that there's actually increased activity around that area. A lot of the fishermen like to fish uh, around the periphery of the farm. Um, and while for safety reasons we can't have them within the cages uh, per se, there is a buffer. And uh, you know we're working on those particulars now as to how close they can get, whether they can tie up, you know where they can tie up, or how they can farm, uh, how they can fish around the farm because there's uh, good fishing. What are <laughs> the uh, so is that a net benefit then? Obviously, you know when you're talking 23 miles offshore, that's a bit different. But if it's closer, what are some of the other like environmental benefits? That well, you so see? what we look to, because we're working with protected species and uh, endangered species, we concerned about whale entanglements and mm. whale strikes. So they want to know how many uh, trips we're going to make per day or per month. Uh, and then as there's increased activity around that farm, um, everybody needs to be schooled to slow down and watch for whales so there wouldn't be any strikes. We don't want to increase any of that. But these are recreational and uh, fishing vessels that are already out there fishing that would just be coming into the area because there might be more fish uh, around the farm. Because of the farmed fish? Yes. Are they coming? What are they coming for, the, uh, the wild ones? Uh, they're coming for, um, as there's equipment, and it's like a reef, right, oh, okay. uh, say? And uh, our site in Florida is actually next to the largest artificial reef in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but it's just the way it, it just brings life. 
and there's better fishing there. <laughs> How do they keep um, birds from uh, going in and feeding, like from the top? Is it covered on the top, these? Covered on the tops. We have predator nets, all type of protective uh, gear to keep that. Um, you know, we have a, a feed barge planned for Florida because it is so far offshore. This is a, a big standalone, uh, holds 250,000 pounds of feed, and uh, you can live on it. It's a live, live aboard barge. So our offshore crew would, you know, rotate out, living out there at um, 23 miles out. But uh, because it's closer here in New York, we don't anticipate we would need that piece of equipment. <clears throat> that sounds so much fun to live on a fish barge 23 miles offshore. Send me a resume. Yeah. yeah. For maybe a week. <laughs> That's true. That's I think true. one night. That would be go good home. for the writing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll have you out. We'll have a little guest <laughs> A sleep. lot of quiet time. <laughs> That's right. Um, um, I think we have so enough. The blockchain way of educating people about the many miles that are on our seafood. Do you have a thought about how we can be reducing the number of miles on our seafood and how much of this farm food is actually going to be retained in a local area? Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. So that would be the goal, to take that product and be able to distribute it as locally as possible and then to work out from there. And then as um, users participate on the blockchain, um, they can actually, we can develop apps that would uh, kind of give us efficient routes where truck space could be shared between the other blockchain users. And um, I think that we can really build efficiencies and make a difference. Uh, and, you know, the ultimate goal is really to get more money into the pocket of the fisherman and the farmer because right now the whole system is so dysfunctional with multitude of middlemen, back and forth inefficiencies. Um, we don't want to eliminate we just want to make it more efficient. So maybe there'll be only two middlemen instead of seven, right? And then maybe that additional uh, revenue could go to the farmer or the fisherman. And is there a way to encourage diversity of species in order to keep things, to have enough diversity local? Well, so that's our make plan. It interesting to the consumer, you know? Yeah. Um, so we feel that um, it would be best for us to have a diversity of species and offer it by kind of um, integrating shellfish and seaweeds and finfish. Um, we're looking at, you know, transporting produce and other items uh, through the trucks um, to be able to, um, you know, make it work economically. The, um, the bureaucracy we've been dealing with, the government bureaucracy, uh, obviously has been frustrating. Uh, we, we have been working uh, on a a very small scale on an oyster reef, which is a mini, you know, compared to what you're dealing with, nothing, but the same repetitive steps um, and the same multiple agencies. Have you talked to any elected officials about that process and, and given some, I'm sure, well thought out uh, ideas on how to streamline it? Yes, I have, very actively. Thank you. I, I won't name them all. They all know who I am. <laughs> But um, Aqua Act, certainly for, for offshore aquaculture, certainly uh, would clarify the path for permitting a farm in the ocean, whether it's a seaweed farm, a shellfish farm, or a finfish farm, Aqua Act would uh, help. Uh, so passing that legislation is a big thing. Um, as far as, you know, it's a different, uh, different analysis when you're in state water, even when you're in the bays here. So um, everybody, I talk to anybody who will listen <laughs> about how important it is that we culture uh, everything in the right way and uh, that we need to facilitate this here as a community to be, uh, you know, I grew up here in, on the eastern, uh, eastern Long Island. I grew up in East Quag. Um, I was born here. Um, when I was a little girl, we would go out on the bay almost every day. Uh, my father, even coming home from work, my dad would get home, we would take a, a late night ride, do some fishing, whether we were fishing for flounder. On the weekends, we went offshore. Uh, we certainly, if we got back early, we would go down the block and pull some clams, scoongeal, oyster, you know, everything. I didn't like oysters then, but <laughs> shucks, I missed all those oysters. <laughs> but now, it's gone. 
all the shellfish are gone. 99% of our shellfish have disappeared from the bays. It's really a travesty. And I um, came back here to live full time in 2004 and was shocked really to see the deterioration of our industry um, and to see that we have the three largest commercial ports in New York mm -hmm. State here. We have Montauk, we have Greenport, we have Shinnecock, and there are almost uh, no vessels left. Uh, there's not enough wild uh, fish to support the industry, uh, certainly not to support industry growth. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity for culture and wild to work together to share resources, whether it's processing, uh, or packing or pack. transport. Um, that's just the way we need to go. Everybody needs to lean in. You would think the governor would be facilitating that. One, One would think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the new legislation for kelp farming, and uh, you know we'll see how long it takes to actually get them permitted and in the water. But um, that's certainly a move in the right direction. Definitely. And also, I mean, preserving the waterfront where you guys are. I know that's one of the things that as these industries have tried to come back and be more like it was 40, 50 years ago out here, um, we've lost so much working waterfront that that's like a big struggle. You know, it's all become kind of luxury condos or, mm -hmm. you know, development. Um, so even if we were to go back, there's nowhere, you know, processing is a big question as well. And again, back to that integration of the restaurant with the working waterfront that helps to uh, solve some of those economic uh, problems or challenges. Um, I think there's a way to rethink it. And one, how can wild and farmed work together and share resources? But two, how can other commerce uh, like ecotourism mm. or restaurants be integrated to help to lift up the industry? And I think we have time for one more question. Are you guys? Okay, our, we've been questioned <laughs> out. I have, I have one. Are our local our New York State senators and our local representatives signed on to the federal bill? Um, well, they're not uh, sponsoring the bill. And nobody locally is sponsoring. Um, however, I've spoken with Senator Jill Brand about it, and Congressman Zeldin certainly knows about it, as does Fred Thiel. And, Anyone else, uh, like I said, <laughs> that would take the time to listen? They haven't taken a vote on it yet, still in committee. So uh, hopefully they'll be supportive when it comes up for vote. But they haven't signed on. Nope. They haven't signed off. <laughs> <laughs> and when, if, if people were watching and they were interested in supporting that, when could they do that? I don't know, because it's still in committee now. Okay. I hope by the fall it'll be... Uh, called. I mean, certainly it's the Aqua Act. They know about it. There's uh, Great discussions. <laughs> it is good. A-Q-U-A-A. -A. Um, so, and again, that's advancing the quality and understanding of American aquaculture. We need it. Well, thank you both for coming for this episode of South Fork Sea Farmers, and um, see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.